Dr. Vanderkolk, thank you for joining us on the show. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Wonderful to have you. Uh, really excited to have this opportunity with you and grateful for you taking your time away from your busy schedule to uh, answer some questions with us. Yeah. Well, one thing that we're uh, really curious about in terms of um, starting the conversation with you is um, I wanted to uh, thank you personally for your pioneering work with in the 90s with uh, looking at EMDR and the brain effects of EMDR because that really um, paved the way for me to, as a resident, to go out and get trained in EMDR and begin using it um, before it was really in the mainstream. So I want to thank you for that. Well, and you know, EMDR for me was really also the opening um, in that EMDR is such a bizarre method. And, um, yeah. and we should really acknowledge that how bizarre it is. And it works. And so for me, uh, EMDR was the first thing I did with traumatized people that really works. And for me, it was the opening like, oh, it's bizarre. Maybe other bizarre things work also. And then so later on, I learned that standing on one foot and putting your butt in the air and breathing in funny ways also changed people. And then tapping acupressure points or putting electrodes on people's heads and have them change to sun. And so it really got, it got us out of this, this Western paradigm. You either give people drugs or you yak. And EMDR was really the liberation of like, wow, there's a whole other world that uh, gets us out of our core paradigms. I think the mainstream of our field is still stuck in the old paradigms, particularly psychiatry, which has become a bunch of drug pushers instead of therapists, which is very sad for the profession, of course. Yeah. I agree, and um, it's, it's something that Keith and I stand for. We run uh, an institute where we teach psychiatrists uh, other ways of helping people get well. And in particular, related to your work, we we stand for somatic therapies as a really important um, component of getting well from trauma. Um, I'm wondering about your sense um, over the arc of the last 20 years with with EMDR in the beginning and, and moving into other strange ways of getting well. Uh, what, is, what is your sense of what is most effective um, in terms of working with trauma and the body uh, versus what EMDR specifically is most suitable for in terms of um, single event trauma or developmental trauma, how, how do you think about the, the different ways to approach somatic healing with trauma at this point in time? <laughs> well, I think first of all, we need to acknowledge that this field is at most 30 years old. And the other thing is that we're living in a capitalist egomaniac society where everybody puts their own methods forth as the answer. And uh, so we're very young. And uh, there is not one answer. And I think the field keeps to continually evolve. And I think it's very important for us to realize that what therapists or psychiatrists do is a very small part of the whole overall healing process. Uh, so uh, for me, maybe the most profound experience I had was following Bishop Tutu during the truth of vaccination process in South America, in South Africa. And um, I saw him, he was about the best trauma therapist I've ever seen. And I saw him do things that I think happens in some ways all the time in traumatized communities in that he had people move together, sing together, dance together, pray together. And he really uh, was a teacher of, although he wouldn't ever phrase it that way himself, of uh, re-establishing synchronicity with people. And so uh, what's, what's very clear to me at the core is that when you become traumatized, your whole system that gets desynchronized from your environment and from itself, basically. And your system gets stuck. And so the question is, how do we unstuck these systems? And sometimes EMDR can be very helpful. But for example, um, since when I wrote uh, my book, uh, 
I got more negative responses about my EMDR chapter, even though I write this very laudatory thing about EMDR, which is a fantastic treatment, in that I said, no, it's not particularly helpful for early childhood trauma that occurs within the context of your attachment system. And I got more angry comments from EMDR people said, no, it works for everything. No, it doesn't work for everything. Nothing works for everything. You know? And uh, what really bothers me about the whole therapy field is that everybody becomes like religious fanatics, that their own particular method is the method that brings us salvation. No, they're just methods that can sometimes be helpful for people, you know? Um, and so what's been helpful for me was indeed EMDR, and the notion that you can do something with people that helps the, the traumatic memory to become a memory instead of reliving. Uh, and EMDR did it extraordinarily well. And I'm actually sad that uh, mainstream psychology, mainstream funders never got interested in EMDR because I think EMDR is a fantastically interesting uh, method in that people are deeply triggered by a particular reliving experience. You make you do these funny eye movements, and then after a while, people say, it's over. Yes, it happened to me, but it happened a long time ago. So there is something about these weird eye movements. And in our last piece of research with Shireen Har Harazian and with uh, Ruth Lenny, as we try to elucidate that, is that you change brain circuits. And that really brought home for me is that our job is to change these brain circuits. And psychology and psychiatry both are so way behind what we know about the brain. And, um, and also uh, the, the laboratories really don't listen to clinicians about their work. So we have all these different islands that people work on that don't talk to each other. But anyway, so, so uh, EMDR taught me that you can leave a memory behind. Um, I think Peter Levine, Pat Ogden, uh, the somatic therapist, really taught me how it's in the body and by moving your body, you can change it. And certainly our research with yoga uh, very much confirmed that. Um, but also, to my mind, has been extremely helpful for me that I see one of the core components of dealing with trauma is what I learned from Dick Schwartz with internal family system therapy, in that um, we are not a unitary self. William James already talked about it. I mean, many people in history have done that. Um, Jung was good at that also. And that is that we may have a part of us that gets enraged and a part of us that cuts ourselves and a part of us that solves our problems by drinking or drugging, but that's not all of us. And to really think about that we are uh, composed of multiple entities that our uh, executive functioning self uh, needs to put together so that we can organize these internal impulses. But to, to think of, about people as in, in parts and how we, uh, we survived various things in our, in our childhood, in our development, by isolating things, by protecting things, by managing, setting up habits of coping um, and acknowledging that some of these habits may have been very helpful back then, like starving yourself or cutting yourself, um, but they're no longer helpful now. And to really deal with the system, to really understand how helpful these methods have been to survive and then to allow people to negotiate with themselves to really begin to give up some of these habits. Yeah, great. Well, you mentioned a few things that um, made me started thinking about anthropology and also more evolutionary theory. I'm, I'm curious about your thoughts on taking the conversation around what's the what's the evolutionary purpose of trauma in humans? Why why do we why do so many humans go through this experience and get stuck in traumatic experiences. And, you know, when we look at it more on a time frame over time and where we're at in humanity right now, and um, how, how do you frame it in your mind, thinking about it from, from more of that perspective of, okay, a lot of people get traumatized, they get stuck in trauma. Um, 
it's designed this way for a reason. Uh, well, how do you frame that in your head? At well, this I'm, not point? Sure if, I'm not sure if designed that way. I, I think by and large, PT, uh, being traumatized in the end stage and in the wild, if you get traumatized, you stop reproducing and it's the end of your life, basically. It's not an evolutionary acquisition, basically. It's the way that the organism sort of survives for the moment uh, by becoming hypervigilant and or shutting yourself down. But it doesn't promote interpersonal contact. It doesn't promote uh, care of the young. It doesn't promote community organization. And I think it's really sort of an end stage thing and it's only in our current state of civilization that we actually um, think we should be able to heal people from their PTSD so they can have a life and become members of the community. But I think by and large, uh, you know, a good example, um, really speculative, is that I have a little cabin up in northern Vermont uh, in a, a little village that was established in 1790. It was established by... Uh, <laughs> Uh, veterans of the Revolutionary War. And I think uh, George Washington very smartly knew that the soldiers who had fought for him would not be helping society to grow. And he gave them 10 acres or 100 acres at the periphery of the American empire to go as far as way as possible, clear the woods, because we don't want to have you around to raise your kids and to be members of the community because you're just too wild and unpredictable. And I think that's what happens when people get traumatized. They really are not, um, they have a hard time really becoming, being productive members of, of their group. And of course, with the advent of trauma therapies, we actually uh, really beginning to help people to uh, overcome that harsh edict that trauma is sort of the end of your life in a way. Speaking of that, um, Bessel, regarding uh, going to the edges of society, I, I'm reminded of um, when I was in training in somatic experiencing, Peter Levine's approach, which I've used now for years. Uh, back in, in a training, we were talking about, we were exploring the issue of shame and um, whether shame one of the trainers was talking about how the circuits, I'm curious if this is true or if you, if, if you subscribe to this view that the circuits that, um, that run shame in the human uh, neurobiology are uh, also present in animals and herd animals. And what was, what was presented to us was that shame um, sort of calls the herd or, or puts the, 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 the person experiencing severe shame on the edge of the, the herd so that the predator is more likely to go after the, um, the separated animal. Um, and so it conserves the health of the herd to have, um, I mean, it's sinister and, and awful for, for human beings, um, you know, to sort of drift to the edge of society so they can be picked off by predators um, for the sort of for the benefit of the animal herd is that is there any truth in that 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 you know of from a I, neurobiological that's not really, that's not really where my th my thinking is um you know it's you know i also enjoy these speculations about what we would like in the in the african savannah but that's not really what i observe you know that's not where i live um what i see is that of course when you're a kid and terrible things happen to you uh, what I find useful there is uh, what Piaget discovered, namely the stages of, of mental development of human beings, and that when you're two or three years old, you are the center of the universe, because that's the only universe you know, and everything good that happens to you happens because of you, and everything bad that happens to you happens because of you also. So if you get beaten up or raped or abused or something, that means to you that I'm a terrible person. And that forms your concept of who you are in the world. And it sort of makes you feel like uh, this is happening to me because I'm terrible. And so that's one of the largest confrontations we have in the clinical work that we do is these very pervasive feelings of self-loathing, shame, self-hatred. That is the inevitable consequence of early childhood trauma. And also the very clear indication that 
telling people that they shouldn't be ashamed or it wasn't their fault or doing anything cognitive doesn't make any difference in the world whatsoever, uh, except it helps people to understand how crazy it is that they continue to feel this way, but they do. Huh? And so trying to talk people out of feeling ashamed is really um, uh, not a good way of treating people. And uh, certainly you should never charge people for understanding how stupid they are for feeling that way. You know, that's like, don't do that. <laughs> uh, what's been fascinating is um, today or tomorrow, there's going to be, be a, a big press release from uh, the multiple uh, the multiple disciplinary association for psychedelic studies reporting on the effects of MDMA. Um, and I won't give you the details because it's still a kibosh on it. But uh, for me, the most interesting thing in our MDMA research is that when people go deeply into their trauma on MDMA, on ecstasy, uh, they really learn to love themselves and learn to really feel like this is what happened to me and it happened to me a long time ago. And they come to the conclusion that it wasn't their fault. And so I think the, the challenge for us as clinicians, which is a very huge challenge, is how do we get people in a deep position of self-acceptance and feeling themselves and experience themselves they, so they can really see what happened to them. They go like, wow, I was so little and I was so defenseless and I was so helpless and look what was done to me. And so you have your adult perspective from which you can look at that kid who you once were and just make that connection with that wounded part of yourself. And I think things like IFS, Internal Family System Therapy, are also helpful with that. Uh, I find neurofeedback to be helpful with that by changing these brain circuits. And uh, I think uh, it's very important for uh, clinicians to really uh, work very hard on seeing what works best for those people. And that means oftentimes giving up your preferred treatment and finding another treatment than what you do already. And that's one of the things that I have so uh, admired about your work, Bessel, is your willingness to continually modify your perspective on what works and to con continually open your mind to new and different ways of, of healing uh, trauma. But, and different by curiosity, not by right. going to the right time. You know, like, well, and, and I, you know, and, and, I, and, and I feel a parallel um, in my early adoption of EMDR and then finding in my experience some limitations with early developmental trauma with EMDR and then going and training with Peter Levine. And then eventually uh, I was a part of a MAP study, phase two study here in Boulder. And uh, I was able to be a study physician, but also more interestingly, uh, one of the therapists. And so uh, the natural emergence of parts work uh, and, and the utility of somatic therapy um, on MDMA, uh, to me, seems light years ahead of uh, working, in my experience, with IFS or somatic experiencing without MDMA um, for these more stubborn uh, chronic cases of trauma. Uh, quite incredible to see people healing themselves, essentially, uh, yeah. with the right kind of uh, holding space. So thank you for bringing the MAPS uh, component forward. We look forward to the to the release. But, but thing that, what you say to me is, uh that you brought your somatic experience and background into your MDMA session that hasn't happened yet uh, in the in the trials and somatic experience is not yet part of the protocol. And, uh, but I I very much encourage my colleagues in the field to to give it a somatic component because really feeling what your body releases there is terribly important also. And there's much to be done in the future with exploring these different uh, combinations of therapeutic techniques. How um, it seems like you have also focused a, quite a bit on post-traumatic growth, uh, especially in regards to um, how people can grow after trauma, uh, how they can uh, perhaps even be more well. Uh, than they were prior to trauma. Um, I, I have a 
visceral reaction against that term. I've against never, post-traumatic growth? Yeah, because I've always seen that term uh, as, as coming from people who don't, who have a hard time, and I can't blame for that, to countenance the horror about trauma. And so uh, as, as I, I've always seen it as sort of, a, oh, let's be chirpy about bad things. Uh, because it's so hard to really, really feel and allow yourself to experience how horrendous a trauma is. Uh, and so I, I don't like the word post traumatic growth. But on the other hand, what makes this word possible is the life force. And what we see in the trauma that people work with is this, this, this astonishing courage to go on with your life despite everything. And uh, this this need to survive and this drive to uh, to live despite of all of it is really the engine of humanity in a way. And so doing this work really confronts you with uh, people who are heroic in terms of uh, being able to go on despite everything that happens to them. And I like to go on a non-scientific level, go as far as to say that I think all of the great advances in humanity have probably been uh, forged by traumatized people. Because if you're not traumatized, life is okay the way it is. Why should you make any changes? But when you're traumatized, you have to find new solutions. And when you look at the biography of somebody like Isaac Newton. I mean, like when you look at his early childhood, you go like, oh my God, how come he didn't end up being locked away for the rest of his life? And he was a crazy guy who happened to invent physics and mathematics and <laughs> invent the science. And I think that's oftentimes happens is that traumatized people uh, find uh, unusual and very creative ways to, to carve out living for themselves that doesn't mean that they're happy people. It doesn't mean that they're filled with pride and joy about their great discoveries or their great contributions. They may be still very miserable, but whatever they do is a way of, of expressing their life force. And it's very, and if, once we start seeing our patients through that lens, uh, we become much more compassionate about who they are actually. I want to return to the thread here of uh, medicines, MDMA, different types of medicines, and um, get your thoughts on what role, if any, do conventional psychopharm have in PTSD? And then also, what role do you see psychedelics potentially playing in PTSD treatment? And how, how do you, how do you, how are you thinking about medications overall right now? Well, you know, as I write about in my book, I was uh, part of that first generation ever to discover psychotropic drugs and uh, thinking that it were the answer. And so I did the first studies on Prozac for PTSD, Zolo for PTSD, uh, Propanolol for PTSD. And uh, we were filled with optimism. And it turns out they didn't work all that well. Um, and what's particularly striking to me is that we did a study at the trauma center, which my center, which was civilian, and half of the study was in the VA, half of the trauma center, and the people in the VA didn't budge. But the VA continues to be the largest prescriber of psychotropic agents, and, and study after study shows it doesn't work. So we're spending billions of dollars bamboozling people into taking medications that really don't, don't do the job. And it's really astonishing to me that people don't say, okay, it doesn't work, let's find something else. Uh, that doesn't mean that psychotropic agents may not be helpful people. You know, I, I have my license, I prescribe from time to time, I, I have SSRIs, I prescribe stimulants, I prescribe alpha and allergic blockers. They have a small role to play in helping people going. The big thing that we have learned uh, that we really didn't know back then is that we have these inborn self-regulatory systems and that the way that we breathe and the way we move and the way that we're being touched and we may move our body has a dramatic effect on self-regulation. And uh, it is 
tragic that in our capitalist system where everything needs to be based on how much money you make, all of these non-money making systems of breathing, moving, uh, yoga, meditation really have not taken off and are dismissed as oh, alternative therapies. No, this is who we are. We are moving, breathing creatures. And uh, to my mind, uh, my dream is that in every school system in America, from K to 12, we have the four R's, reading, writing, arithmetic, and self-regulation. And that every week, every kid in America, through its entire education, learns how to regulate themselves and learns the mechanism of self-regulation uh, because it can be done and it will get us out of this pathetic drug addicted society that we live in. Um, but, you know, there's room for medications. I have nothing against them. They're, they have their role, but uh, it's very important to assess, is this working for you? Is your life better? And much of the time it isn't. And then come in psychotropic, the psychedelics. And of course, psychedelics is a whole different issue because it's not you give people psychedelics to uh, maintain them and to allow them to tolerate bad stuff. You give psychedelics in order to create a new mindset. And um, the great thing about all of these agents is it puts you in a completely different frame of mind. Uh, when you're traumatized, you live in a very narrow, constricted reality. And your fear and your terror and your rage is all there is. Uh, our president's current president's almost over is the, the is the, the poster child for all this stuff. And we really should say that. And his followers probably also, they have this narrow reality of uh, I'm threatened and terrible things happening to me. And then uh, and what do these agents do? They open up the universe. Uh, you start seeing and experiencing things you have never seen before, you have never experienced before, and you go into a state of, oh my God, the universe is so much larger than what my little mind has been able to construct. And you start opening up your mind to explore other ways of being in the world. And most of these agents also give you a sense of, oh, I'm a part of this gigantic universe, and I have my own role to play. Uh, but I'm just a very small part of a larger whole. And I think all of these agents give you a sense of awe about the complexity of where you live and the relative insignificance and significance of you in that larger reality. And so it gives you a larger context. And these are momentary experiences. Um, these are not things you do on a regular basis uh, in the... Studies we do, we have three sessions. I don't feel great about it. I wish we had an option to do anything between two sessions and 10 sessions, um, which in reality we'll do. But of the people I know who uh, work on these substances, I think um, I can call them pretty much at any time. And I don't think they'll pick up the phone and say, sorry, I'm on an acid trip right now, and very sorry, I'm on drugs, because uh, these drugs are very powerful experiences and you set the time aside to go through it, but you don't do it lightly and you don't do it recreationally at all. And, and do you, how do you formulate in your mind treatment plans with these medicines, these psychedelics that hopefully are coming, uh, assuming they get through phase three? And like, is it for you, is it there's certain people that will do their psychedelic treatment plan and they've moved through their trauma and they move on with their life? Or is it a more integrated treatment plan that you see these fitting into for, for many people that take months or years to move through? Um, that's a very good question. I haven't really thought about it. You know, in, in my own practice, I'm certainly prepping a bunch of my own patients for the moment it becomes legal for them to have these experiences. And I think that the therapy that we have done up to now uh, will really help them to have a much richer experience than if they hadn't done it. Um, but by and large, I think when people are done with their psychedelic experience, they're done. Usually they don't go, oh, let's do a lot of 15 years of psychoanalysis after that. Uh, 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 but it's, it's so it's an excellent question, actually. Um, to be 
to be discovered how how it will change our practices. But I think it certainly cuts. Uh, I think a lot of people stay in therapy for a long time because they can't move. And when, once these drugs really open people up, they really come to certain resolutions. And the great concern I have uh, is again that in the culture that we live in, it's the quick answer and the magical answer, and this is the right drug. And what they see already happening with ketamine, for example, is you have all these ketamine clinics, people are giving their ketamine and sent off to their own apartments uh, to take these drugs. I am horrified by that. Huh? What we do in our MAP studies is ketamine-assisted psychotherapy, MDMA-assisted psychotherapy, where we create a context where people can safely go into an altered state of consciousness with people around you who are really there for you, who hold you. You know, these experiences are not fun and games. You know, like going deep into your trauma is always horrendously painful and terrifying. And having people around you who are there for you who look benignly at you, who don't intrude in you, but really are there to hold you, is terribly important. And I really honor uh, Rick Dobbin at, at MAPS, who really is the engine team behind all this, of insisting that uh, whatever work we do is going to be done in a very, very carefully held environment. And that's how people at Hopkins are doing it, and people at NYU are doing it. And that's the right way to do it. There's, it's not a shortcut. Right. Uh, need to really be there for people. I, I couldn't agree with you more. And Keith and I uh, also run a ketamine assisted psychotherapy clinic uh, where we insist that the patient is in, uh, is held with the right set and setting with a psychotherapist throughout the entire process uh, and with a physician on site to make sure that, you know, any safety issues are covered. Um, it's, a, it's a bit really the therapeutic holding at the, yeah, uh, experiencing what you're experiencing, like like a kid with his parents, you know, like like mm -hmm. you know, kids have nightmares, you know, and but right. as long as parents are around, you know, you, you can manage your nightmares. So like uh, that sort of thing. Yeah. One one question that comes up for me um, around MDMA assisted psychotherapy for PTSD is the trial that I was a part of. It was um, you know we had people who had had decades of therapy um, prior to entering the trial. Um, one person had over a thousand sessions of therapy previously. Um, and I'm wondering your thoughts about where w we might intervene with MDMA-assisted psychotherapy for PTSD. Are, are we going to um, use it as a frontline agent or is it going to uh, be a thing that someone has to try and fail a number of other therapies before they have access to that? What are your thoughts on that? I think it's too early to tell. You know, the the great issue right now is that all these, these drugs right now are still illegal, except for ketamine. And so uh, I think the question for MAPS, among other people, is will we train enough people to be able to provide very good therapy? And how will we organize ourselves to really uh, take care of the de demands? Um, and I'm very curious how that will work itself out and there's always, there's so many factors in, involved in that that um, I think we'll just see how it goes. But I hope it's done in a very careful and controlled way. But I think a lot of people I've seen over the years um, would really benefit from it. Um, and I think it may change. I think it's going to change the whole therapy field in a profound way. Yeah, yeah and it's, it's such a unique... Um, uh, therapy, because we're talking about a um, completely seamless uh, interplay between MDMA and the and the psychotherapy itself, which is such a huge shift in the thinking. Right, it's a shift for FDA to be thinking about that as they consider whatever the they're going to be considering from phase three. Sure. Um, it's a huge change for therapists to be thinking about too. Um, I, it, you know, it's, it's, I, I, you know, I do a lot of supervision these days um, via Zoom. And I meet therapists all the time who try to fix people and who try to change their behavior and to uh, to manage people. And I go like, 
you know, I've never been able to manage anybody. I can barely manage myself. And like, how can you manage other people's behavior? I'm really just astounded by this. And there's one thing about MDMA assisted therapy or ayahuasca or any of those things is you don't manage anything. You're just, all you do is create a safe environment where people come up with their own solutions and all this, I'm going to make sure that you never get angry with your wife again, stuff like that. <laughs> that 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 time hopefully is over. Like, um, and it's been a very bad direction in terms of therapy. And people try to please their insurance company. So yeah, I got this patient to behave better at all the I have to admit, as a psychiatrist entering the world of maps, I had to unlearn some some habits there <laughs> of of trying to. Uh, take responsibility for uh, the healing process in a way that is extremely different from what the protocol uh, is that, that, that maps is, uh, is working with, which I think is so exciting because it, it places the, um, the empowerment so deeply in the patient. It's your life, you know, Uh, you lead, you need to find out how you want to lead your life and, what your options are and what your capacities are that you have, which are very different from what I have, you know? Like, yeah. Yeah. Do you uh, have any, um, do you have your eyes on anything that's to come decades from now in trauma therapies that we're just, we don't, we know very little about right now, but you're kind of watching An example would be like virtual reality or uh, things that, we might have access to uh, as the technologies get better over time that you're just kind of watching and wondering like, where are we headed in two decades, three decades from now in trauma work? I, I have to answer two dimensions here. One is that, uh, you know, because of my book, I, I daily get numerous requests for referrals and I have very few people to refer people to because as it is, very few clinicians know more than one thing. And for me, right now, if every clinician would learn uh, sensory motor therapy or somatic experiencing and IFS and EMDR um, and really good uh, trauma processing verbal stuff, there'd be a long way, but very few people do that. And so uh, for now, learn what's available and you'll become a much better therapist. You don't have to go much beyond that. Uh, The other, see, my other piece of research is in neurofeedback. And it's intriguing that while neurofeedback is not as sexy as psychedelic therapy is, um, I think it has much larger public health potential in that there's uh, at least half a million kids in America who are being abused and neglected at home who cannot learn because of their trauma. And one thing I'm actually working on here in Berkshire County, where I live right now, uh, is to get a neurofeedback system in every school uh, where uh, kids can be trained to train their own brain waves. And I think uh, it's been, I've had a very strange experience with neurofeedback. So neurofeedback is a what it is, is that you uh, put electrodes on people's uh, skull, you harvest the brain waves underneath it, you can create a map of the brain fairly, quite cheaply, you can see what part of the brain is talking to what, you can hook it up to a computer, and you can play computer games with your own brain waves to reinforce certain patterns and to inhibit other patterns. It's very effective. I've done now four studies on the subject, all of which came out very well. I've gone to NIMH four times, six times to get it funded. They have uh, refused to fund any of the studies. Um, I think neurofeedback is a huge thing for the future. Uh, When you start looking at these brain scans, these quantitative EEGs, and you see how the back of the brain that's supposed to be really calm, sort of monitoring your bodily self, is just going crazy. You see these abnormal brain waves, you see different parts of the brain not talking to each other. When you see these maps, you go like, oh, you're doing remarkably well that you've only tried to commit suicide 15 times because when you see how disturbed these brains are, it's really stunning. Um, And so we have the technique to regulate these brain waves and with that people's behavior to a large degree, but boy, it has it been extremely difficult to get it organized and well-funded, et cetera, et cetera. 
but I think that's a very important part of the future is to really do applied neuroscience and apply all the things we have learned about all the different parts of the brain that gets get messed up by trauma at various ages, stage of development, how you can activate those is really a great frontier. And are, are you looking at in your, what you've looked at with neuro, are you looking into actually, let's say we take, for example, somebody that's got some pretty serious complex PTSD or something like that, just serious PTSD. Or you, have you been looking into like actually how to use neuro to increase regulation and inhibition in the brain? Or are you looking yeah. more at like the injuries that come from that, what comes from that over time, like the learning uh, issues and things like that? I, I don't, I, I think DSM was a fun thing when we first put it together back in 1980. It's become an abomination, actually. Um, it's a list of symptoms that don't exist, like uh, it's a pseudoscience uh, type of stuff. So, but we're dealing with people who are confused, people who are, can't concentrate, people who can't focus, people who can't control their affective systems, people who have poor executive functioning. And so we're measuring indeed how well people can organize their lives, organize their relationships with other people. Um, and uh, when you really look at the brain waves, you can really see, uh, when you look at the quantitative EEGs, and you have a fairly good understanding about neuroanatomy, you really say, oh, that's why you have a hard time focusing, or that's, oh, that's why you have a hard time sleeping, or that's why you have a hard time sort of staying on track, because that's not talking to that. And so I, I really hope that over time, uh, psychiatry, such a sad profession, uh, will become real scientists again and learn, actually learn their neuroscience and learn what we have learned about the brain and apply it to clinical practice. Yeah, it would be nice to um, examine the organ that we treat in psychiatry. Yeah, but, but the other part of it, of course, is that we, we don't only treat that organ because we human beings are such deeply intertwined creatures, that we are social creatures. And so we also need to really look at our how we relate to other people, how we interact with other people, how much comfort we can get from each other, etc. And to a large degree, in our paradigm, we still focus on people as individuals, rather than as members of a tribe or a group. Uh, and that's a distortion of reality, of course. The reality is that none of us exist by ourselves. All of us are uh, completely intertwined with the people around us, and our biology is intertwined with the people around us. Uh, Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, I agree. And it's, um, we're social animals and, uh, and, and the relational field is a critical element of our, our health, um, or, or lack thereof, depending on, um, what we see. I think what we see as possibilities from childhood trauma, um, can greatly limit, uh, what, what our actual experience is as adults in relationship, um, and before we move on from the neurofeedback, I just had one more question for you, Vessel, about do you, uh, one of the things that we've been thinking about with our clinic is, um, is there a role for neurofeedback in the, uh, in the integration process that can follow, uh, for example, ketamine assisted psychotherapy or eventually um, perhaps MDMA assisted psychotherapy uh, as a way of reinforcing these new uh, connections and uh, neural pathways? Is that something well, I, that you're considering? Uh, I wouldn't have the, I, I, I think I'm too far on the downward slope of my development to. Uh, to do that work. I mean, I, I think it would be a great piece of work to do, actually. Uh, what can ketamine do? What can neurofeedback do? How do to do reinforce each other? Be a really worthwhile project to look into. Um, to what degree do they do the same thing? Uh, so I've had some extraordinary, extraordinary successes of 
people with horrendous chronic trauma who are always dissociating and spacing out and unable to focus and unable, unable to feel themselves. Where on neurofeedback, they really became, they did found themselves. They found their identity and they found their, their core. And, uh, and so I've seen people do extraordinarily well on neurofeedback. Um, that may also be true for ketamine. I've not seen those results in ketamine. I'm still puzzled about ketamine. Uh, what can it do? What can it do? I've had my own ketamine experiences. They left me also very befuddled about what's going on here. Uh, um, so these are all questions that we need to ask and answer. Yeah, makes sense. Well, let's wrap up. Uh, we ask this to every guest on the show. Uh, we we ask if you had a billboard that every human would see once in your life, uh, and it was had a paragraph on there. What would you like them to know? I have many different scouts on my mind, actually. Um, uh, one of the things that come to my mind is uh, something Dick Schwartz likes to say, uh, and that's that if you knew the background of the people you dislike and hate, and you knew what they're coping with, you'd have a great sense of empathy and that, and that we all go to, go to the same experiences, and that we are all in the same boat in a way. And that uh, even the most absurd person you know uh, is dealing with the same issues as you're dealing with. Um, and the things that we have in common and how kindness and connection is everything. Yeah. Hmm. Very beautiful. Yeah, great. Thank you, Vessel. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks for being on the show. Yeah. Thank Good you for all that. the pioneering work that you do and continue to do. Okay. Good luck to you. Okay. Bye-bye. Thank you so much for your time.